Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chairman, the Board of Trustees of the Mutala Mohammed Foundation, former President of the Chairman of Basanjo, I'd like to welcome you all this morning. I'd also like to welcome our mother, Mrs. Ajoke Mohammed who is also here with us today, the Vice Chairman of the Foundation and the person who was the vision behind creating it in the first place. A big round of applause will be appropriate. Since last year, we were unable to meet because of the COVID era, and in that year, she celebrated, I think, her 80th birthday, although I always think she doesn't look any year like that age. I'd like to welcome also the governor of Ekiti State, Dr. Fahadeh Fayemi, who is not just governor of Ekiti State, but chairman of the Governor's Forum. He has also been a minister of the Federal Republic. And of course, if you look through the program today, you will find out that his history of service to this country is very long and checkered and certainly not by any means over yet. He is our guest lecturer, speaker today on a subject that is dear to all of our hearts. I'd like to welcome the representative of the Chief of Air Staff, Air Vice Marshal Nambi Ananaba, who is representing Air Marshal Moladayo Amawi. Also, I'd like to welcome the representative of the Chief of Naval Staff, Rear Admiral Bamdili Rua Gwinila, representing Vice Admiral Awal Zuberu Gambo. We would be expecting to welcome some other governors at some stage this afternoon, and I'd like to, with your kind permission, wait until they arrive before introducing them. On this occasion, I'm especially happy to, on behalf of the foundation, welcome a special group of people who are somewhere in this room. And they are especially important because they are parents of some of those of our compatriots that have been missing for very many years, from representatives from the community of Dapchi and of Chibok. And I think a round of applause would help us remember exactly why it is that they are present with us today. A little scene setting is always important. And it's important that I let a younger generation remember what this is all about. The Mutala Muhammad Foundation, the lectures have been going on for I think about 44 years, but the formal founding of the foundation was about 20 years ago. But I can see that there are a lot of younger people in the audience. So let me give you an incentive to go and do some research and to think about some things. 46 years ago at the age of 37, on the 13th of February, 1976, we lost General Mutala Muhammad. At that time, he was head of state and 37 years old. He would have been 84 years today. But, well, not today, November the 8th, 2022. I think it would have been his 84th birthday. But for those who talk about youth, at 37, he had attained the rank of general he became head of state. He countered, helped to counter a rebellion, fought in a civil war, run a government as head of state, and had already been married at 25. For a dozen years by that time, to a beautiful wife who gave him five children. That is a lot to pack into 37 years. And it's very happy to say his children are with us today one of whom is on the foundation, Mrs. Aisha Ibadi, but uh, also uh, his sisters, 
His brother Ariska is going, uh, his son, sorry, Ariska, is going to be with us later. But Tati and Jumai Reide are with us in the room. Now, the foundation created by his family immortalizes him. As much as you know, the Naira note, the 20 Naira note, has his portrait. And the airport, the most important gateway to the country, is named after him, as well as very many roads in very many states. And of course, Abuja itself is the state capital that his administration created, or at least had the vision for. Breathtaking, isn't it, that someone could pack so much into 37 years. Our mother, who I'm happy is here with us today, and she's being very patient. She's heard this very many times, and I crave her indulgence because there are younger people who might not know. But she was only 33 when she took over running her young family. She had been a bride at probably about 21, and we celebrate her today. She has kept the memory going for the nation, not just the family. And she herself has been very accomplished as a mother, bringing up children and grandchildren. We thank her for having the special vision long before so many other people that the, the ecology of the country was important. She's got green fingers, and she has started many a garden that we love to visit. As I mentioned before, she's an octogenarian, but she's not a very good advert for octogenarians because she looks more like she's probably 60, 50. What do you think? <laughs> Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it was just to give us a reminder of the importance of this foundation, especially important because today our theme is beyond Boko Haram, addressing insurgency, banditry, and kidnapping across Nigeria. There's no better a person to address that topic than Dr. Karade Fahemi for reasons which you can either read in the brochure or I'm sure some of our dignitaries will speak about later. So once again, welcome. I know that Baba, the former president, Oshayi Mabasanjo, is with us online. I'd like to welcome him once again and thank him, as always, for being such a solid support for the family, the Murtala Muhammad family, but also being a relentless support of this country and making sure that it continues to work and be a great country. Uh, he advised us, I think, in a speech a few days ago that we should be more rebellious. It, we should always keep that in context. And remember also that in that context of speaking truth to power, he has been very much the leader in that regard. Please welcome from online, and I hope the technology all works, General, former President, Oshagno Basajo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Mutala Muhammad Foundation. Apologies. I think we might not be quite ready for President Oshaga Basajo, and I did skip an item. I should probably have been introducing Mrs. I'm ready. I am ready. Thank you, sir. You are, not, you are saying I'm not ready. I'm, I'm ready. Thank you, sir. I, I took you by surprise. You were expecting to have listened to Mrs. Oyebode first. Please carry on. You are hearing me. Because I heard you, you are saying I'm not ready. I am ready. Always, sir. Hello? Yes, 
Yes, sir. I hope you can hear us, sir. I was introducing you to the occasion yes. and for everyone to recognize your presence. But we'd like now, first of all, to listen to the welcome yeah, address. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come and make sure that I'm hearing this thing well. Okay. I don't want them to I'm not hearing well. Are we sure that the audio is working properly? I'm going to invite Mrs. Oyibode to come up and make her welcome address, but please, as soon as we're online properly with the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, could you put his image up there so he can listen in to her welcome address? Mrs. Aisha Oyibode. Make sure that you know whether he is going first or I am going first. No, so I'm going first. Okay. I think it's all. Yeah, uh, yes, it's sort of. It's um. <laughs> Good morning, um, Your Excellency. Let me start by Your Excellency. I know he's online. Former President Olusegun Obasanjo and Chairman of the Mutala Mohammed Foundation. Your Excellency, Mrs. Ajoke Mohammed, Vice Chairman of the Mutala Mohammed Foundation, and my dear mother, all distinguished members of the Board of Trustees of the Mutala Mohammed Foundation. Your Excellency, Pr the Governor of Ekiti State, as well as the Chairman of the Governor's Forum, Dr. John Kayode Fayemi, who is also a distinguished guest lecturer today. Your Excellency, former Ogun State Governor and Senator Amusun, the representative of the Naval Chief of Staff, Vice Admiral Awal Zubairu Gambo, who is here, Rear Admiral Bamidele Oluagbe Mila, my apologies, it's the writing, it's not that I can't pronounce it, it's the person who wrote it. Um, and then the representative of the Air Vice Marshal um, representing the Air Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Oladayo Amao, Air Vice, um, <coughs> who is, um, uh, apologies, it's writing, we wrote it. It was the technology, my battery died this morning on my laptop, so I really must apologize. So, let me start again. The representative of the Chief of Air Staff, um, Air Marshal Oladayo Amao, who is here, his representative is Air Vice Marshal Nnamdi Ananaba. My family that is here, my father's sister is here from Kano Haja Balaraba Ramat. Um, all of our distinguished guests that are here that have continued to support us for the last 20 years, you're all welcome. Again, I'd just like to welcome especially our family and friends from Chibok. They're sitting all at the back. And also our family and friends from Japshi. They have all become family and friends of the Mutala Mohammed Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you here. I have people from near and far. There are people here who have come from the United States. They're visiting Nigeria, but they're here. So welcome to all of you. 
They're all great supporters of the Mutalam Ahmed Foundation. Can I have the presentation, please, the slides? Thank you. I think we're missing the first page. No. Okay. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe it. 20 years ago, I still remember it distinctly like it was yesterday when we started this. Um, it started out, you know, before then, we used to have the annual Daily, time le Daily Times lectures. And then in 2001, late Onukaba Adunoye Ojo, who used to be the CEO of the Daily Times. Next one. Oh, I'm using really a little. Thank you. Um, approached Baba and said he thought it was time for us to set up a foundation. So Baba named who you know he thought should be the members of the board of trustees. Without my knowing, he then put me forward as, as the CEO. I had no clue. All I had was a vision. I knew what late General Mutala Mohammed stood for in his private and his public life and nothing else. 20 years later, with the support of our amazing board of trustees, all our friends and our family, all the people that are in this audience, we have done incredible things. In 20 years, we have grown organically, and with all respect to all the international foundations, I know Dr. Kole, Ford Foundation, all of them, we can stand tall and we can stand next to them. We have done incredible stuff. <laughs> so our thematic areas for the foundation, because it's important for you to understand the work that you have been supporting. So we do a lot of work um, humanitarian support. We have a lot of um, educational programs, women initiatives, and also this is one of our forum, policy, advocacy, and dialogues. When we first started, we started with the annual lectures, and now we've moved on to the annual conferences. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is a very complicated slide, but this is actually the work that we do. So our main focus, if you look at the top of it, is empowerment. What we try and do in all the work that we do is to empower the people that we support. Or the people, actually, we don't support them. They are our partners. That's what we call them. Because we believe that if you empower people, right, then they are the same people who will come back and support you. There are a couple of people in the audience here. We had a student um, several years ago who came to me from Chibok at that time when the um, Chibok abductions had happened. And a lot of the young men, you know, we forget how it impacts the girls as well as the young men, felt disempowered. And he came, he said he wanted to work as a paralegal. And um, I went to Benga and harassed him because of his law firm. And I said, you must, uh, my husband is a lawyer, you must employ this young man. And eventually he said he would. And then the young man came back and said, oh, I see, actually, no, I think I want to go into business. And I'm like, no, you're not going to business. You either go to school, or they know me. I'm like a school teacher, or we leave it. You know, he came the other day and gave a testimony and said, oh, the first time he told me that I was so angry and he went away for a while. Then he came back and said, you know what, I thought about it, and I actually want to go to school. So I said, no problem. Go and apply. He applied at Unilag, took jam, failed the first time, called me, tears of, oh, I failed jam. I said, you're not the first person to fail jam. Can we get him a lessons teacher? Please go and retake jam again. He retook jam. He got into Unilag. Um, two months ago, he graduated top of his class. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And that's why we talk, 
about empowerment. So, and I will jump, so I'm gonna go backwards and forwards on, 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 on the slide. As part of the empowerment, one of the things that we have is, let me go to educational programs and then we'll come back, is our scholarship program. Because I've started talking about Mohammed, it's really important for you to understand our educational programs. What we, we to currently today, we have about 120 scholars on our educational program, from primary to tertiary um, to university. And we say that there's no child that does not have ability, and that's one of the things that we, we do. We actually have a program for children with disability as well, because as far as we are concerned, the most important thing about education is not where you get to at the end of it, is at the end of the day, where we take you from. So not everybody has to have a university degree, but the most important thing is that we educate you within your ability. It's such an important program that this year, we actually decided to name it the Starfit Program. You know, all, all, bear with us, those of us that work in the NGO sector, we like to tell stories and anecdotes and so on. The story of the starfish, I don't know if anybody is familiar with, starfish, they're like fish that look like stars. Um, and usually what happens is that the ocean washes them onto the shore. Now when the ocean washes them onto the shore and it gets really, really hot, the sun gets hot, they actually die. So one old man was walking on the beach one day and he saw a little boy, and the little boy kept picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the ocean so they could survive. And the old man said to him, young man, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, I'm putting these starfish back in the ocean because if I don't, they're going to die. So the man said, but look at the whole show. There's so many of them, you know. So he picked one up, threw it in, and he said, at least I have saved this one. I think it's an important lesson because when we started in education, we actually thought we could be everything to everybody. But you have to realize within your limits, what is the best that you can do. And so we have decided every child that we educate is what matters. We don't have to do 100,000, but the 120 that we have this year we're going to make sure that they get the best education possible. And that's why we change it to the Starfish program. So let me now go back to my um, humanitarian support. So our humanitarian support program was done to support the communities that are affected by disaster. Some of these communities we're going to speak about. And I'm talking about the length and breadth of Nigeria. People have suffered from ecological disasters. People have suffered from kidnappings, banditry, flood, all of that. And what we started with, we got our baptism of fire in 20, 2001, when the Ikeja cantonment exploded. The cantonment bombs happened on a a Sunday. If they had happened on a Monday, it would have been disastrous because so many schools got destroyed. Fortunately, the children were not in school. However, there were families, women who had gone trading far away. There was a particular family that we encountered, mother we encountered. She had gone to trade her wares. She didn't even hear all of the Noise, you know, we heard a lot of it in um, different parts of Lagos. When she came back, she was shocked. What's going on? Where are my children? They said to her, everybody who heard this noise ran in the direction of a canal. So they all ran in the direction of that canal. Woman gets there, and as she's standing there, she's not seeing, they're bringing out bodies. 
You know, a thousand people drowned in that canal that day because of his fear. They didn't know where to go. She said as she was turning around to leave, somebody said to her, Edu, they brought out her first child. Then they brought out her second child. Then they brought out her third child. And they brought out her fourth. All her children had drowned in that canal. As if it was not bad enough, she gets home. Her husband's family throw her out because they decided that she must be a witch for something like that to happen to her. Those were the kind of human stories that we started to encounter even that early when we started. So we knew that it could not be about food and not, you know, just food items. You know, it's easy. And I'm not disparaging people who do to give bags of rice, to give this, and then walk away. But the human stories are unending. I have mothers here whose daughters were taken eight years ago. No clue of where those girls are. The mothers from Dapshi, you know, they took them away. One month they came back. Five of the girls never came back. Some of the parents are here. And I want us, when we are listening to His Excellency Governor Fahimi, to think about the human beings behind the statistics. These are human stories. Each and every child, each and every man, woman that is affected by a disaster speaks to so many different people. So I've thought about humanitarian support. I don't want to go through all of the statistics. Is there, you know, over a million people, beneficiaries that we've supported. We also have a safe schools initiative. We do a lot of advocacy and policy influencing around trying to make sure that we provide some kind of support. And I'm really glad that there are representatives of the military here, because one of the things that we found in the course of the um, looking at this problem is that young men that are in communities that are affected by conflict are really frustrated. And many of them come to us and they say, please, where can we go get guns? We want to go and fight. I said, there's no, you don't need guns. Go, let us see if we can find a program in the military that will allow these children to channel this anger and this frustration. So please, please, it's something that I really, really want the military to think about. We have a few. One has joined the, um, actually I have two girls. One has joined the army. One is about to, she wants to join the Air Force, and I, no, the Navy, and I have a young man who's joined the Air Force from some of these communities in the Northeast. It's a very important thing. The more we can get these children to channel their energy positively, you know, the better it will be for them. And what it does is that it empowers them. It empowers their communities because they feel that at least they can fight back legitimately. Um, we have, we talked about medical services, we treat um, PTSD, and then we rehabilitate the community structures. In the video you saw some of the Ikeja cantonment schools, we've rebuilt them since then. We go around rebuilding where things have been damaged because we feel that we need to be in those communities for the medium to the long term. I've talked a little bit about our educational um, programs, some of what we do is um, digital literacy because we think that, I don't think we need to provide people education of the last century anymore. If we're going to provide you education, let's provide you education that allows you to compete anywhere else in the, in the world. So we're working, working on that. I have told you what it is. So we have, in the last 20 years, we've given over 500 scholarships this year alone we have a 110 um, scholars. We have some of our supporters here, but I'd actually like to mention somebody, I know she won't like it, Professor Okome. She's a professor at the City University in New York. She's one of the great supporters of um, our scholars, so she's here, so maybe we can acknowledge her, please. We have the MMF Zuba Box. They're container schools. We started building using containers is the previous slide. Uh -huh. We use, use containers um, for education. 
um, and of course we do a lot of capacity building um, around education, you've seen that. We work with um, school management boards, we work with teachers, you know, uh, 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 and so on and, and so forth, yes. But our aim is to improve the quality of education as well as to provide as many, many young people an education. And for those of you that are in this room, on average, actually, to educate one child in our program is between 50 to 60,000 Naira a year. A year. So anybody who is interested, and they will get, you know, so if you, it's something you are interested in, please let's so it's not an exorbitant uh, um, amount. And that includes medicine, you know, the sciences, and so on, yes. Okay, a lot of our women initiatives, um, some of you have, are familiar with it. We are committed to closing the gender gap. Um, and so what we have is we have two programs, Women in Development, um, and it's aimed at economic development, empowerment, and regional integration. So what we do is we partner with women in different parts of the African continent to see how we can create um, value um, cross borders. Now, again, another anecdote, I'd like to share them. I went to meet the president of Namibia several years ago, um, and he said to me, you know, one of the most incredible things during the apartheid resistance movement was when they came to Nigeria and realized how enterprising Nigerian women were. He, that's what he told me. He said to me, there is so much they can teach us. And that was actually how that program was born. We said, let's see what we can all teach others. And you know, we talk about barriers. You know, we like to talk about, you know, general um, trade agreements, treaties, and all of that. But the people who build our economies in Africa are the women who carry the goods on their heads and on their backs. They walk across these borders. So, oh, you know, when we're talking about cross-border trade, that's what they're doing. You don't need to get on a plane. You don't need to, they actually literally walk across these borders and they're bringing things in and out. Some of them, simple things like some people go across the border, ice block, they bring it back, but they are the ones who are carrying our economies on their backs. We also have a lot of women farmers that are not acknowledged in a lot of these communities. And that is one of the most frustrating things about the insurgency that is happening in the Northeast and has moved to the Northwest. A lot of women can no longer farm. And I know that there's a deliberate ploy beyond wanting to kidnap girls to also frighten communities so people do not farm. But these are the women that are carrying our economies on their shoulders, and they're not farming the standard things that we know. Yes, they do um, beans, they do corn, but they also do the things that can be exported, sesame seeds, cashew, honey, all of this. So I sometimes wonder, you know, why is it that we're still importing all of these products? These people have, we actually have the capacity in Nigeria, you know, to feed ourselves. Now, one of the things we do is that we also bring women that have excelled in different parts of um, the, the, the continent. Some of you recognize um, Grasa Machel. Um, some of you recognize Amina Guri Fakim. She used to be former president of, okay, former president of Mauritius. And then we also have Mrs. Dr. Joyce Banda, who used to be the former president of Malawi. And what we do is we bring them to Nigeria because we want our women to understand that you really, um, these people who are able to achieve these things are women just like the rest of us. And so what we do is that we allow them to come and speak um, to our women um, and we're going to have another program like that early next year.
So, um, policy advocacy dialogues. This is um, where we are. The next slide, please. No, no, the one before. Okay, so um, that first picture was actually the first lecture, the foundation, I think that was in um, 2002 with um, Sir Ketimule Masire, um, former president of Botswana. Um, so he, he was the one who, who came. Um, the next one was our first annual conference. Um, you know, that was, I believe, in 2003. And then these are pictures from all of the other conferences. And it's really important because those pictures are chosen deliberately. We have members of the military who've always been our constituents and they've always supported us. And of course, you know, all of us um, in the audience. And then we also have members of the diplomatic corps who also make an effort to, um, who always support us as well. Um, so I'm going to start um, rounding up. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have a lot of upcoming programs. Um, humanitarian support, we talk about it. We talk about situations of fragility. That's what His Excellency is going to talk about. Um, kidnappings, banditry, abductions, because it creates fragility in our societies. And the reason why we call them situations of fragility is so that we understand that when these things happen, people become fragile. So we have a lot of programs in that area. We are going to build up our humanitarian programs. We want to set up technology labs beyond, so we're moving beyond the computer for schools. Um, computer for schools, we actually have computers in 50 schools are across uh, Nigeria, but we now want to set up technology labs in regions so that you know we can actually go beyond just ICT training to see what else we can do in the area of technology. We, so those are the things, a lot of work around leadership and governance. So I'm gonna round up very quickly. I want you to take a look at this slide because it's one of my favorite. So when, the f these are some of the pictures we got many years ago when we were starting our computer for schools programs. This is how they used to teach ICT on the blackboard. Can you see? So they will write on the blackboard, they will draw a monitor, they will draw, um, you know, talk about you know, which was not a way to learn, because if you don't use a computer, you'll never learn to learn. So that was at the beginning. Can I show them the next slide, please? No, no, before this. This is it now, ICT lab. And then I deliberately showed some of the pictures of the young people supporting us, um, because part of the program, and also for those of you in the audience, when your children come to you over the holidays and they say, I'm bored, I have nothing to do, send them to us. We'll go and see, get them to teach these kids. These are actually three of my children teaching some of the children ICT. Yes, can I have the final slide, please? So what we're saying is that you are our partners. Please work with us. Let's put our heads together. We, I mean, we have, this has been an incredible journey. We believe that it can even be more incredible. So join us, work with us, and let's see what the last slide is. The, and I'd really like to just acknowledge all of the partners that have worked with us over the years. We are truly, 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 truly grateful um, for all of your support. Some of the members of those um, organizations are here. Neem Foundation would like to thank you. LECOI would like to thank you. I look at everybody, they say you don't thank those at home, but would like to thank you. And so many others, this day access bank, all of those are here. AMG Petro Energy, would like to thank you um, for all of your support. Let's have the last slide, please. Let's make this work. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen,